Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much Your for joining our... Your conference is being recorded. That always trips me up. Thank you for joining our uh, conversation today, All Around Procrastination. My name is Laura Caden. I'm a senior consultant here at the Cornerstone Group, and I will beg for forgiveness. I am just rounding out two weeks of having a cold, so um, I'll promise not to sneeze and act too much. <clears throat> so it's interesting. I'm um, I'm currently reading a book by um, Adam Grant, and his book is called The Original. And in part of his conversation about what does it take to be an original thinker, um, he talks about the importance of procrastination. And I've never really thought of it that way. It's, it's interesting because procrastination is a common thing that we all share. And, um, and I never looked at procrastination as a positive thing. He talks a lot about um, in this book, and if you've read it, you, you know what I'm talking about, um, around Martin Luther King waiting until the last minute to write his I Have a Dream speech, and then actually in the middle of the speech, recrafting it and writing it on the fly. Um, he talks about, you know, Abraham Lincoln and his Gettysburg address, and um, waiting until the morning of to do the final touches of a 272-word um, important speech. And so we all procrastinate, and um, and if you're like me, if you have kids, and I have a 20 and a 17-year-old, um, my kids are rock stars at procrastination. And procrastination at the end of the day is it's avoidance, plain and simple. It's avoiding things that, you know, we know we should be doing, but, well, we aren't. And like Larissa not sending the invite out to everybody until yesterday was procrastination. Um, my pulling together this presentation was procrastination. Um, and so what's the connection? You know, what, what does PI have to do with procrastination and, and where does it weigh in? Um, and so I'm going to share with you um, a story. Um, it's a conversation about a client of mine um, that I had. And I'm kind of going to walk through, um, it's kind of a, a verbal case study here to talk about how procrastination happens, and what the effect is. Um, so the story I want to talk about is um, a story about um, Liz and Simon. And, um, and the story really is about how procrastination has such a profound impact in the workplace. So here's Liz, and you can see her predictive index pattern. She's our lead character, so to speak. So I want you to first off look at her PI and say, hmm, what is she trying to procrastinate in this story based on what you've learned about behavioral drives? What what might she be avoiding based on how her PI is built? She has spent the past year in a brand new, newly created role um, at a large community bank here in New England um, as an assistant to the social and community director. And this is a um, a new role and I will also say her job assessment for this role, she was a mid-fit for that role as well. So some of her behavioral play out in this is also because there's not a perfect alignment in what was expected in this role, but um, it really is behavioral impact between her and her manager. Um, so part of Liz's responsibilities included um, managing all event logistics for this community bank, coordination of speakers, you know, making sure the function area was ready, making sure that they were tied into critical activities in the state, um, that they were heavily involved in large-scale kind of community involvement programs. Um, so her sole purpose in this role was to make the bank look good whenever they had events. But there constantly seemed to be turmoil and confusion um, between her and her manager, Simon. And I'm hoping that his PI will come up because for whatever reason it is not. So I am going to show you his PI. Hmm. Well, this is unfortunate. I can see it. You can't see it. It's not building. There we go. There's Simon's PI. Um, and so there was a lot of turmoil and confusion between the two of these people. Now, Simon was in charge of the big strategic initiatives, orchestrating like very large community and statewide events with some pretty impressive local business speakers, um, nonprofit speakers, um, and kind of community 
community-led organizations and was gathering a lot of monetary support for these programs as well. These were a big deal, to say the least, and all the projects were really critical and important from a brand perspective because the CEO was new. And these were his passion projects. This is how he was going to um, differentiate themselves, their bank, from other banks in the area. But Simon had a bad habit. He had a bad habit of talking and walking and shooting out ideas in the hallway. At least that's what Liz thought they were, just shooting out ideas. But in fact, they were deliverables with no timeline that he was gabbing about. And based on his own predictive index pattern, he was pretty generous about delegating nonstop to her without kind of following up and following through to make sure that um, she felt she was in a good space and she knew what to do. <clears throat> so this last event was the last straw. They were holding a large company-wide all-day off-site wellness event, um, and they have over 200 employees that were going to be attending. And they use Slack, which is an internal communication program. And she could see there were still some unanswered questions and some logistic issues even a week before this big employee event. And um, so some of the speakers hadn't been contacted. They didn't have some of the bios. Some of the lighting issues weren't figured out. Some of the catering things weren't completed. And she started to get very anxious and concerned. And as you can see, with a high level of formality like she has, you can see where that was coming from, anxious warrior. And um, so she would shoot him a quick email to ask what the event needed, where did he want her to lean in, did he have, you know, was he in control of what was going on, what could she take off his plate, no response. And then he went on vacation. And he was on vacation all the way up until the day before the event. And then 3.30, the afternoon before the event, he burst into her office and interrupted what she was working on to tell her the 30 things that still had to be done before the speakers arrived, before the event kicked off. And not to mention these were all things that she had asked about a week ago before he went on vacation. So let's just say these two were in a bad place. There was a lot of anger. There was a lot of frustration. There was a lot of stress. After Liz's first year of getting frustrated and not saying anything, just kind of swallowing it and kind of marching forward, um, she finally decided she had put it off long enough and it was time to speak up to Simon and say something. So she really needed to kind of confront the issue. She had to be tough. She had to be forceful. She had to be aggressive. And she told me, I had it all planned in my head exactly what I was going to say. She said, I'm going to tell him, Simon, you know what, an emergency due to your lack of planning – uh, over here, um, does not constitute an emergency for me. And in her head, she was like, I sounded really tough. I mean, I was going to tell him off. And, of course, he was going to tell me, oh, Liz, I'm so sorry for what I've had to put you through. That really stinks. Sorry about that. Thank you for everything that you do, your hard work, just to let you know this will never happen again. Um, I don't think she was really in touch with reality because that's probably not, and actually it's not, what really happened. So here's what really happened. <coughs> when you ran in, hair on fire, she took a deep breath. Her hands were shaking, she said, and she said, hey, Simon, an emergency due to your lack of planning doesn't constitute an emergency on my part. And she was really proud of herself. She'd done it. She stood up to him. But his response was not what she was hoping. He looked at her and said, but Liz, these things still have to be done. And her temperature rose. I mean, he just wasn't responding the way he was supposed to. He was like, didn't he get the script beforehand? Didn't he know his lines? He was supposed to say he was sorry. Didn't my first statement take care of everything, the whole due to your lack of planning, it doesn't constitute an emergency on my part? And she thought they were good to go, but um, what was he doing? He wasn't responding the way that um, she was hoping he would. And um, so being completely impaired, unprepared, which is she has kind of a mildly high C, right, right on the average. Instead of pushing back and creating any conflict, she said fine and stomped around the event space, setting things up, incredibly frustrated. So she was trying to put things off. That was her procrastination. What was she trying to put off? Having a tough conversation with Simon about capacity and planning. 
And as a lowest dominant person here, as our lowest drive, it was all about putting off that opportunity for conflict to arise because conflict is painful. Um, and the issue festered. You know, when we talk about people sometimes, and I say this a lot when I do my training around lower dominance, is we fester, 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 and then we go postal and people are so taken aback by it because the level of frustration has been building up like sediments. And um, and then we blow up and we start bringing in everything from every other situation. Um, and the more it festers, who gets most upset over and over again is Liz. Um, and unfortunately, she chose to confront the situation with Simon when she did in a time where he really couldn't hear what she had to say due to the fact that everything was coming up in the next 24 hours. Um, and so Liz really kind of completely negated what she was trying to accomplish. She ended up looking kind of like the fool by stomping around the um, event area and not changing her behavior. So why was Simon procrastinating? You know, why was, you know, why was he running into the auditorium an hour or two, you know, or, the, you know, 24 hours before with his hair on fire? Well, he was avoiding the details, um, the monotonous of what he viewed, aspects of the event, tying everything up. Um, his highest drive, higher level extroversion, he loved bringing in new speakers, talking to businesses, getting people to participate in these, you know, community programs. He loved talking to the newspaper about community involvement and, like, telling everyone in the bank about how great this program was going to be. And so he was a high engager. He was – his whole energy was focused on that. But where his energy was not focused and where he was procrastinating is the details and the execution. Um, because part of that meant he'd actually have to write things down out exactly before he went on vacation, that he would have to make sure that everything was tied up nice and neat, that he would have to make sure that um, he answered Liz's emails on Slack when he was involved in doing other things. And when you have a lower level of patience, which is really kind of interesting, is um, that's where you sometimes will see procrastination. I mean, bursting into this place, you know, full tilt with pressure is actually what energizes someone like Simon. That is not what energizes Liz. And so certainly outside of procrastination, failure to communicate, failure to kind of have tough conversations is part of this. Failure to build a good strategy and a plan are certainly the backdrop to it. But the procrastination piece is what really kind of undid these two people together, working together. And so <clears throat> when we look at um, procrastination, it's our lowest drive. It's really our lowest drive that tells us, you know, what are we trying to procrastinate doing? Um, and so the more often we procrastinate those things we should be doing, like I said tuning in, but should be turning in. Can you tell I have an average level of formality? In that sales report, making a tough call to a client about maybe, um, you know, a mishap, being direct about a performance issue with an employee, maybe even being really direct and honest and transparent with a peer. Um, and the more we push it off, the more often we set ourselves up for failure. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through each of the behaviors and talk about how each of these behaviors play into how we procrastinate. Lower dominance, as I've already said, is about avoiding conflict because we prefer environments that are harmonious, conflict-free, politics you know, politics free. We hope we have an environment where there's team collaboration. It's supportive. Um, and so we can procrastinate when we have to have what I call tough conversations. And so Liz and Simon. Um, and you know what? What's interesting is this can, for lowest dominance leaders, translate into not addressing some real issues head on. Um, as single contributors, it can mean they don't bring up problems they're having with team members or even their supervisor if they're working on a project. Um, and if, if you can think about it this way, a good way to think of it is it's like carrying around what I call an emotional backpack. Um, and if you can envision a low-dominance person carrying a backpack around the world, and every time they get frustrated with a certain person or situation, um, that frustration turns into a weight that they add to that emotional backpack. And um, and then fast forward, that relationship a few months and bad interactions into the future, and what do you have? You have somebody that has no more room for any more bad interactions, and then that's when they kind of go crazy. And um, 
and there's a proverbial kind of like straw that breaks the camel's back. So when that backpack reaches its limit, what you tend to see is the lower dominant person just empties it all out just based on that growing frustration that they have. And um, and I'll tell you that <laughs> it is um, it's not a productive way of interacting in the office. And you can even think about this at home, too. You can think about, um, I'm really good at doing this with my kids where I get frustrated about what they don't do, and then I unload it all on them in one fell swoop. So how can we prevent this? I mean, if we're looking at a lower dominance person, the real fear that they're facing when they don't speak up is that people are going to be upset, that people are going to be mad about what they have to say. And the truth is most of us worry, the worry in our heads, you know, I know I'm guilty of this, is everything is good, everyone's going to be upset about what I have to deliver for information, when in reality it usually all turns out fine. Um, if as leaders we want our low dominance people to feel comfortable bringing issues to the forefront, confronting problems with teammates in what I would call a constructive, dysfunctional manner, whatever, we have to create an environment where that is supported and encouraged, an environment that's safe where we can weigh in and create some team accountability. Um, and that's really going to have to come from this, this kind of environment piece to who we are. Um, the more a low dominance person feels as though they are confronting issues, they, um, their confronting of issues isn't going to end in a conflict-ridden mess, like it's going to get brought up in every meeting, people are going to remind me of it, or it's really going to um, hurt my internal relationship with the person, the more likely they are to bring up um, if they disagree or have a certain idea because they feel like they're able to do that. They've got a safe space to do that. <clears throat> and when I spoke with Liz and she finally kind of started to communicate with Simon about some of the tougher issues, you know, I'm not her manager, but my response to her was, you know what? That was tough to speak up to him, and I know that was really uncomfortable, and I really appreciate you doing that. So the more you can support them from a coaching perspective to congratulate them on kind of stretching themselves and doing something that's not naturally comfortable is really important. So lower extroversion, they want to avoid commotion, right? Their preferred environment is time to close the door, time to think, introspection, time to have a chance to kind of look at the data. And so if you think about that, then – um, why they want an environment where there's time to close the door and time to think and time for introspection is so they're better prepared for a potential conversation, right? And um, and it's interesting that of all the lower drives, this can be the toughest one to pin down because um, commotion can be defined so differently, among, you know, among different types of people. And for a lot of lower extroverts, that can translate to small talk or getting to know their employees personally. Um, sometimes you'll have to um, – low Bs might want to avoid work social functions like Sally's birthday celebration during break um, or, you know, a team session. Um, but it can also translate into not speaking in meetings. They might wait until the last possible moment thinking that the time might run out prior to their turn. Um, this can also translate into kind of reiterating information that's already been communicated because – in the low B's perspective, it's already been communicated once. So when you think about all these different scenarios, um, getting to know their employees or coworkers personally is really critical. Um, not going to work social events, you know, we talk about that, about being able to kind of connect. When I work with teams, I'll tell them they have to find ways that they can get people to connect in a purposeful way, too, because people who are more introspective aren't as comfortable getting involved in a lot of social events. Um, <clears throat> and But the key thing here is getting that person to understand the more they can unfold a little bit, connect with people internally. It's interesting. The more they get to know you personally, the more they see you as someone who is vulnerable, that someone who might have flaws, that someone um, who they can actually connect and communicate with. Um, so for lower B people, the procrastination piece is really about, I think the last line I have in here, not being prepared and, um, you know, what's going to happen at this event, what's it going to feel like when I communicate with people, if it's a networking event, if it's a meeting, am I going to be able to present my information in a clear way, which is pretty important. Um, and I, I personally have a lower level of extroversion. 
Um, and that is pretty critical for me. Like on the meetings front, the best way to overcome that for me is a real clear agenda and really good facilitation. Um, and so I feel like I have the ability to weigh in um, in a meeting because I'm prepared for that. Let's talk about patients, low patients. Um, what do they want to avoid? Monotony, doing the same thing over and over and over again. Um, so low PCs are procrastinating that. They're putting off sitting still and doing repetitive tasks, right? This is because they really thrive in an environment where there's variety, there's multitasking, there's pressure and change. You know, that stress and push of pressure to complete something last minute is an energizer for them. You know, often when I work with people who have really low levels of patience, I'll ask them, were you the kind of person that waited until like 12 o'clock midnight on Sunday to get that paper done that was due tomorrow? And they'll nod and they'll say, yeah, because that pop of pressure got me going. I did my best work then. Um, so to, I guess, Adam Grant's point. Um, <coughs> so a lot of this procrastination, too, can come from in the form of kind of paperwork. For example, expense reports can be a big one. Um, low patients people tend to be folks that looked at the first, you know, fifth grade science fair as like, well, the whole thing's due March 5th. If I start on March 3rd, I got plenty of time. So, you know, the last minute person. Um, and low patients people navigate the world focused on those items that have the most pressure associated with them. So if there's no pressure associated, why even start the project? Um, and the great positives that this can bring, though, is maintaining composure under pressure. You know, they have a large comfort level juggling multiple projects being very responsive to their environment um but that can sometimes be overshadowed by the fact that when low c's procrastinate a project like simon until the pressure is ramped up um they need folks to help them with it and when they're coming to ask for that help um who are they going to people like liz right so right before the deadline and so what happens when you're running around last second with tasks that you have high patience people around you trying to weigh in on um, you're not as effective. You're throwing a lot of frustration and pressure on the team. Um, so one good strategy for low patients people um, is procrastination is becoming an issue is to have a regular conversation about priorities. What's on the plate right now? And I'll often say to people, say, what's going to be our challenge? What can get in our way of being successful? Um, what are the three top priorities that you need to be focusing on this week? And, um, and I would say also, um, when you look at it too, what will this employee need to show me by the end of the week based on this conversation? So Liz, you know, every time Simon had a conversation with her, he should have had more direct conversations with her around, have we built an extra time to make sure that we can get this project completed? So it's not to say that, you know, priorities aren't going to shift. They do, but it can be helpful to have at least some set direction. Um, and then when we look at formality, low formality, what are they procrastinating? Rigidity. They want naturally flexibility, unstructured, nimble environment where, you know, again, paperwork um, can be delayed. Um, and so they're trying to get away from constraints. They're trying to get away from feeling restrained and fettered. Um, when I work with salespeople, their biggest complaint from the sales managers is nobody ever puts anything into Salesforce or turns in their reports on time. And that's traditionally because they have a lower level of formality. It's task minutia-based administrative stuff that they don't want to work on. Um, and, um, and also the other hard time thing they have, too, is working on anything that is translated to it has to be done exactly as stated in the direction. And my best example of that is one of my very good friend's sons just finished at Princeton, and he has a lowest B. And one of his professors had told him at the beginning of his last semester, he said, um, <clears throat> as long as you do the assignments exactly the way I tell you, you'll pass this class. It couldn't have been more clear. And let's just say that Hayden struggled a bit with this professor. He tended to procrastinate his homework for that class because he knew that he had to come up with the exact answers the professor wanted. There was no flexibility in interpreting any of the data. So he put it off until the night before. And even then, it would take him forever to finish the simplest of problems. It was just so painful for him to live in a world and work with somebody who was so rigid. Um, so how do we help our low D friends to overcome this procrastination? You know, many times it's highlighting the areas of their job where they need, where they do get some flexibility and freedom. Um, and I know for Hayden, um, there are many times where all he could see is that one area of rigidity, and that was the speech at the beginning. As long as you do everything exactly the way I say, you'll do fine. Um, 
And But when it's pointed out to him that he gets to do whatever he wants in all other aspects of his education, his other classes, matter of fact, even in some of the projects he could do in that particular class, he was less frustrated. So, you know, take some time and think about the space where they all have the freedom to color outside the lines and point it out. Um, but then also get them to understand that, um, you know, the procrastination piece is actually to their detriment when they push that off. So kind of quickly gone through what a person tends to procrastinate based on the lower drive. And, um, but there's one way that you can help people, um, and that is to coach to their higher drive. Because if we focus on our higher drive, remember, that's where we get our natural self-confidence from. That's where we can kind of key in and help people understand how to approach things differently. So I'm going to go to high dominance, and I'm going to give you two PI patterns. Um, and this is Joe, and this is Mark below. And um, so high dominance people get their self-confidence internally from having an impact on the world and getting results. So if you want to connect getting them to change their behavior and how it might help them get results, talk about Exactly. So a good example of this comes from a training I conducted a few months back. And um, Joe, who's on top, who has a high level of dominance and a lower level of extroversion, AB relationship versus um, Mark Below, the BA relationship. Um, and Joe was having some real issues getting the results from Mark. And not surprisingly, because Joe wasn't spending a lot of time building a relationship with Mark. He didn't understand why this guy wouldn't just do what he needed him to do. He'd be barking out orders and being very authoritative and directive in what was expected. And Joe would call him every day and tell him what he should be doing and wasn't doing right, but nothing was changing. And so when I talked to Joe, I said, well, <laughs> this guy's only been with you for six months. How often do you just talk to this guy to connect with him, get to know him? And um, he said, well, we do talk. And I said, what do you talk about? And he said, what are you supposed to be doing? I said, that's what I'm talking about. So I said, Joe, if you want this guy to be productive, you have to build some sort of personal relationship to connect on a different level. You know, when was the last time, um, you know, you saw the productivity you wanted from him? Um, and he said, well, honestly, he said, the last time was when I was in the office, and I asked him, a little, I had heard he'd been on vacation, and we talked a little bit about his vacation. And I said, so part of getting somebody who's higher in dominance in this case to understand what behavioral changes that you needed to make but to kind of help him understand what would the impact be by making a small adjustment. And it's actually an adjustment in his dominance and his extroversion to be able to connect with his employee. Then if I look at my extroversion team, so back to our group in the very beginning, um, you know, once Liz eventually realized how badly she kind of screwed up this whole interaction with Simon, um, she actually gave her a lot of credit. She sat down and had a conversation with him where she laid out the situation. You know, Simon, my bad. I behaved inappropriately last week. And I want to apologize. I kind of mishandled our conversation and the situation, and I really want to start the conversation over. When we're having events, how do you think we look as an organization when you've brought in these high-paid speakers and these really important, um, you know, community people um, into our sessions and they come to this beautiful space, but what they're seeing is they're seeing us running around frantically trying to make sure that everything is done just right. Um, you know, you're so talented at getting these amazing speakers to come, packing the auditorium, and I just feel like we don't look as professional as we could, especially when we wait last minute to put everything together. So one thing I'd like to do is I want to make sure we can improve our image and our relationship by making sure that we connect earlier on the topic of, you know, sound, light, whatever it is, how can I help to facilitate that? And so she took a lot of ownership of that conversation, which I give her a lot of credit for. Um, and so from that point forward, they met once a week in advance to talk through what was logistically still needed to be tackled. And she took ownership of the logistics pieces, the pieces that Simon didn't like. So easy peasy. So the number of, you know, hair on fire incidents dropped dramatically the quality of their events are getting better, and their relationship is better because it called out quite obviously where the disconnect was and how easy it would be to fix it by having a conversation. Now, of course, secretly I'm thinking Simon probably should have been the one to have that, but um, bravo for Liz. Our next one is patience, and, um, and the driver behind that is familiarity. So they get their self-confidence from working in the familiar, being with familiar people, so both people and process in their day. 
So one great way to coach a high patience person, especially if they are low dominance like Liz was, and they're uncomfortable putting off having a tough conversation, is to emphasize how they're not having that talk could be maybe impacting the rest of the team, the rest of the project. And that's never a good thing for a high patience person to hear, that they're hurting their kind of quote-unquote work family. So if you can then offer to simulate the conversation with them until they feel comfortable, so that means practicing. Hey, that's what I did with her. I said, well, let's talk about how are you going to present this information to Simon that makes you feel comfortable and you feel like you will be heard. Um, and that was really helpful for her because that's where they build their confidence. They get more comfortable with the conversation. They've given it a try in a, low th- in a very low-threatening area place with me. Um, and then they've practiced it, and they're able to have that conversation, um, and their confidence starts to go up. And then the last drive is formality. And so knowing what's perfect and not getting paralyzed is really important. And so when you're coaching high Ds, you want to focus on where they can get their self-confidence from, and that is knowing that things don't have to be absolutely perfect. It's all about changing that definition. And sometimes it can take quite a bit of information to prove to a high-formality person. Um, It might take follow-up meetings to give them more information to help them be more comfortable with changing their behavior. The more you can be prepared to back up how you're asking them to change with hard proof, the more likely you're going to see them change. Moving away from perfect is important. And I would even go back and say, if I go back and look at, um, you know, Liz's pattern, you know, moving away from perfection um, was important as well for her. So knowing that we have enough information, we're able to execute, and mistakes may be made, but <clears throat> but even if mistakes are made, it's not, you know, we've got a kind of like a backup plan. So I know I am running over the allotted 30 minutes. Um, this was a quick conversation about procrastination. I'm going to open up and ask if anybody has any questions. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for being on the call today. I hope this is helpful. Um, This will be posted on our website as well. Have a great weekend.